Welcome back, everyone, to Furthering Christendom. I am your co-host, Mike DeVito, here as always with Dr. Tyler McNabb. And Dr. McNabb, we have uh, some surprise news. Maybe you could fill us in. Was there a birth or something? You have a, Is there another kid in your house now? Yes. Yes. Party of five, as I call it. Oh, my goodness, brother. How, how is everybody doing? Healthy, happy, safe? Yes. No. Mom's doing great. And uh, baby's doing, doing really well. Sleeping a lot. So. Yeah. All looks like you're horrible. sleeping a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need to sleep more. <laughs> well, uh, congratulations, Tyler, Tyler and Priscilla and everybody in the McNabb family. That's uh, really exciting. And we're so happy for you. Um, today's guest is Father James Dominic Rooney. Father Rooney is an assistant professor of philosophy at Hong Kong Baptist University, whose work focuses primarily in metaphysics, medieval philosophy, Chinese philosophy, and philosophy of religion. So, Father Rooney, thank you so much for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Happy to be here. It's a lovely sunny day here in Kowloon Tong. So, uh, thank you all for having me. Oh, of course. Well, we don't want to we don't want to keep you away from that sun out there, but uh, we do really appreciate your time. And and today we're going to focus our conversation on Catholicism uh, compared to, and contrasted to Orthodoxy. And so. Maybe to start the conversation, I can ask you, what is Eastern Catholicism and what separates the Western Rite from the Eastern Rite? Yeah, <clears throat> so I should, uh, uh, the reason I've been invited on this show, I should mention, is because I am, in fact, an Eastern Catholic priest, even though I'm a member of the Dominican Order. Um, so I know them a little bit from the inside. The Eastern Catholic churches is what they're called. They're particular churches, not just, for example, a liturgical rite. Um, they're not even merely individual dioceses. They're whole communities of churches, of dioceses, that form a unity under their own archbishop or patriarch and are governed by their own canon law. So the Eastern church, Eastern churches are separated not only by different customs or liturgical traditions, but also by their own theological tradition, canon law, and hierarchy from the Latin Catholic Church, from the, sometimes the Roman Catholic Church. All Eastern Catholic churches are in communion with the Bishop of Rome as the first among all bishops, and so with all of the universal Catholic Church. How did these groups get formed? Well, some of them never knew um, any difference of communion. So, for example, the Maronite uh, Catholic Church, which is in Lebanon, uh, is its headquarters is in Lebanon, uh, have never been out of union with Rome. They're an Eastern Catholic Church that was always in communion with Rome. And there were always a number of uh, dioceses, particular dioceses, and some groups uh, that were in communion with Rome. Uh, and uh, alongside those, um, there are sometimes what are called derisively union churches which is after the great schism, the break in communion between the East and the West. It's hard to say there was ever really a date. 1054 is the date most people give. But what basically happens is there are lots of times of sort of fading out of communion, coming back into communion, having unclear canonical status between who's in communion with who for, for centuries. And what happens is some of these groups that we would call Orthodox, came into communion corporately with the Catholic Church and constitute Eastern Catholic Churches today. They joined up with those groups that never went out of communion. So for example, in my Byzantine Catholic Church, the Ruthenian Catholic Church, we had a big group that came into communion that was basically uh, part of the, the hierarchy of the Orthodox Church in the area. The Ukrainian Catholic Church is, um, was basically the Russian Orthodox Church corporately came into communion with Rome and the remaining people constituted the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, as you can tell though, these, this process of breakup tended to be acrimonious. So when, when these Orthodox churches broke up like that, the people that got stuck staying or didn't want to join in the communion um, hated it. Um, and um, this is why today the Catholic Church decided not to encourage that. If individuals want to become Catholic into communion with Rome, no problem. But we otherwise aim only at corporate reunion. The whole church has to come over. We're not going to take part of it. 
So that's that's sort of a breakdown. Yeah. Gotcha. And so, so what can the Western right learn from the East? Yeah. So I mean, I think the Latin, the Latin right, uh, the Latin Roman, the Latin Catholic Church, is as I said, not just the liturgical traditions, but I think it is helpful to say one of the ways in which the Latin Catholic Church can learn from the East is certainly, I think, importantly. Uh, a lot of elements about its liturgy. So liturgical traditions, what are they? Liturgical traditions are really, in my opinion, just different aesthetic expressions of the same faith. And when I mean aesthetic, I mean they're, they're sort of performances, they're corporate modes of prayer is what they are for public prayer. That's what a liturgy is. And um, each liturgical tradition is like a whole, embodying different principles of aesthetic organization and performance, but everybody has the same faith. So they're doing different things, but they, they basically have the same faith that they're expressing. Now, I'm personally quite fond of the, the Latin traditions worship. The classical Roman approach to liturgy reminds me a lot of the good points in Zen Buddhism. And it's not actually a coincidence because some of like the Buddhist tea ceremony in Japan borrowed from the Roman Catholic Tridentine mass. So it's sparse, it's choreographed in a simple way with direct and understated gestures. And I contrast the Byzantine tradition, my, my other tradition, is contrary to that, much more like Tibetan Buddhism. It's all about putting on and off big hats, big complicated hats many times. It's about big showy processions with gongs, right, and blowing horns and that kind of thing. And lots of walking around things, repeating the same thing and pointing at them, right? The modern reform of the Roman liturgy after Vatican II, I think, had good principles. So if you read Sacrosanctum Concilium, which is the document of Vatican II about the liturgy, I think basically most Eastern Catholics could accept a lot of the principles in there as good fruits of the liturgical reform, like the principles are very reasonable. And I even think the, the, the East basically has acknowledged and had in their own way uh, admitted that they do need some liturgical reform because there are lots of weird practices um, that make their, their liturgy less than ideal. But I do think a lot of Western people have felt Vatican II's reform of the liturgy, the way it was implemented in that, went wrong in a lot of different small ways or um, you know, important ways there, were, there was loss. Uh, of some of the things that were good in our Latin tradition. Um, I think we can, we all know cases of iconoclast, right? People who said you can't do that here anymore after Vatican II or false ideas of simplicity. And I think we just recognize, most people who are normal in the Catholic church recognized we lost a lot. And we tried to, we're trying now, I think, to recover some of it. Some of the things I think that we lost were um, we lost a certain structure to our liturgical music and texts forming a unity. You know, a lot of the ways Catholic liturgy is in the Latin church is sort of uh, pieced together. There was, I think, also like a reverent attitude of a certain kind, which I think is expressed in things like the ad orientem liturgical gesture, which is the priest and the people facing the same way, away, you know, toward the, the icon, toward the altar. And also, I think just generally the notion that aesthetics matter <laughs> in stuff like vestments, music, and environment, there was a sort of false idea that like we have to be poor and not, not have nice things anymore. And I, the Orthodox have retained all that, which makes them a good touch point for us Latin Catholics. We can look at them and say, look what they have. We should have that. Okay, so one area of disagreement, obviously, is around centers around the Pope. And so Orthodox will often say that there's no evidence that's the, that the East believe that the Pope possessed universal jurisdiction. Um, and so what is meant by the term universal jurisdiction? And do you agree with this view? Yeah, so I should say this is, this is like opening a can of worms because the doctrine is, is very complicated in a, in a lot of ways. So let me just start with what's uncontroversial. I think it's fairly uncontroversial for everybody, Orthodox Catholics, and to a certain extent, well-disposed Anglican Protestant historians, that the data from the early church shows that the role of the Pope was unique. The Pope here just is a word for the Bishop of Rome. There's, the Pope is a special word for a patriarch 
I mean, the Patriarch of Alexandria is called the Pope. Um, and the Church of Rome served as a special role as an ultimate court of church appeals. So it was like the Supreme Court in uh, the early church in a lot of different contexts. So there's a lot of evidence that everybody agrees that there was this right or this privilege of the Catholic Church, of the uh, Bishop of Rome's church. Orthodox canon lawyers, lawyers uh, recognize the way this pri privilege develops. So there's a very early indication of this privilege called the Sardican privilege, which is in the uh, right after the Council of Nicaea. Nicaea references, uh, notes that the Church of Rome is the first among all churches in the list of the hierarchy. And right after Nicaea, there's a council of Sardica in 343 AD that basically gives the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, the right to of ultimate appeal. Any people can appeal their cases to Rome um, from all over the, the Catholic Church in the Roman Empire. And what, what do we mean by universal jurisdiction? Well, there's obviously a, a meaning of universal jurisdiction from this, from being the ultimate court of appeal. Just like in the US, the Supreme Court has universal jurisdiction. What that means is the Supreme Court can hear a case from any lower court, can appeal to them, right? That's what it is to have ultimate uh, uh, universal jurisdiction in, in, in judiciary power, because the lower court, right, the Supreme Court can make a decision affecting any of the lower levels, right? So it has to have the power to do that, right? The jurisdiction to do that. Um, the doctrine of the Catholic Church at Vatican I is that the Pope has universal supreme and plenary jurisdiction. Jurisdiction though, in the church is kind of a different concept. <laughs> um, so uh, when we have this kind of role in the church, um, it's obvious for one, for one level, that the Pope is the first among bishops, he can serve as the ultimate court of appeals. That's just gonna be that he has a certain juridical primacy among all the churches in the Catholic Church, in the universal church. Everybody agrees then that the Pope's proper role at least extends to educating disputes between bishops, coordinating their efforts and so forth. And even Orthodox theologians have thought this is a good idea. So there's a famous Olivier Clément was a French Orthodox theologian that wrote a very good book on this. But there are easy ways to misunderstand the doctrine. One might think this, right? Just as the patriarchs have primacy over sees, right, that are under them, or a bishop is in charge of his diocese. So the Pope has like some, he's like the head bishop and the whole world is one diocese. But this is wrong. This is entirely wrong. Um, because our doctrine doesn't require that kind of primacy at all. And I should also clarify, infallibility uh, of the Pope is, is relatively ho-hum. It follows from these claims about ultimate jurisdiction. The, the claim is not that the Pope could be able to overturn all of our doctrine by fiat tomorrow morning. Infallibility of the Pope's decisions have to do with the fact that he's like the ultimate court of appeals for a lot of these things. So in the case where he might make a, a decision that touches on some of these doctrines, right? The idea is he can't, I mean, he would represent the whole church's belief on that, right? So just like the ecumenical council teaching together represents the whole church's belief. So in this special case where he's legitimately exercising his functions as the first bishop, right? He can't, he, he's representing the whole church's belief. He can't be wrong just as the whole church, we believe, can't make a mistake uh, on matters of teaching the faith. So that's that sort of just follows from, you then have to ask the question, well, what is his legitimate role, right? And the, the differences between East and West really come down to, to two things. The first is, um, uh, or I should say, the, the real question boils down to limits on the Pope's jurisdiction or limits on the exercise of the Pope's jurisdiction. And here, in fact, Catholic doctrine is terribly sketchy and it's open to developments because we say there are limits. So um, at Vatican I, um, the bishops uh, of Germany uh, rep were responding to uh, von Bismarck in Germany, who said, well, the Pope is just like a king. He can change everything. He's the monarch of the Catholic Church. And this Vatican I doctrine is just, you know, makes him in charge of everything everywhere. 
And the bishops of Germany said, well, there are clear limits, moral, moral limits on what he can do, but also the constitution of the church itself prohibits the Pope. The Pope can't change those things. The Pope can't change the doctrine that's already been defined, things like that. He couldn't abolish the mass or fiat that atheism is true. Um, all of those wouldn't be his exercise of his jurisdiction. So um, here, I think, basically, theologians need to sort of gird up their loins and answer, work out exactly what those limits are. Uh, because the Pope in the current Catholic Church exercises a lot of roles and privilege that are accidental to his role, where everybody agrees, every Latin theologian agrees they're accidental. Like the Pope currently appoints all bishops in the world. That's contrary to ancient and even fairly modern practice. That's a brand new thing. Um, and the historical reasons for that weren't just self-centered power grabs. It was supposed to like increase efficiency and competence through centralization. But Pope John Paul II and Benedict said, we shouldn't do that anymore. We've got to find some way to reverse these things and figure out exactly what we really want the Pope to do. Um, the Eastern Catholic churches that I'm a part of elect their own bishops under our own canon law. This was the ancient practice of the church and I think we can and should reform Latin canon law to reflect that Eastern Catholic practice, as well as, um, you know, clarify the limits on papal authority. But I just wanted to, to point out, I mean, the idea of what the Pope's jurisdiction exactly entails, apart from that juridical primacy, it's just not clear. That was very helpful, Father Rooney. Thank you so much. Why don't I kick it over to Tyler and he can uh, keep it going. All right, great. So thanks, thanks for that, Father. Um, what would you say is at the heart of, of the disagreement? You, you got a little bit into that uh, in, in answering Mike's question, but can you go a little bit further in um, talking with us about really what's at the heart? We had uh, uh, Dr. Bradshaw on here talking about his new book with Swinburne on orthodox and natural theology, orthodoxy, and natural theology, and I asked him the same question, right? There, there are kind of like optimistic theologians like David Bentley Hart, well, you know, he has a, a kind of a well-known paper, Myth of Schism, where he, he basically says not much, if anything at all. <laughs> and then you have obviously old school orthodox uh, apologists, so to speak, that, you know, make it seem like Catholicism is miles away <laughs> from orthodoxy. Uh, so just if you want to kind of elaborate a bit more on what you were uh, discussing with Mike. Yeah, so as I said, uh, I mean, I, I was starting to go toward, I think, what the differences are. So I should say from my perspective, I'm in one way relatively optimistic, but I represent, what I'm gonna say is basically represents joint theological statements by Orthodox and Catholic theologians and our hierarchy. And from my perspective, there really are no substantive theological differences. Big fat zero, none. Um, whether sacraments, race, Trinity, or anything else. Uh, I think a lot of the Orthodox apologists who are working usually from old books of Orthodox apologetics, very often just don't understand a lot of Latin Catholic doctrine, or what they do is they read somebody like Augustine or uh, St. Thomas Aquinas and think their views exhaust the Catholic Church's uh, theological tradition and say, well, he believes this and uh, Gregory Palamas says that, and therefore our faiths must be, must be different. But of course, that's not how the Catholic Church works. We don't, we don't just um, accept uh, it's not like Thomas Aquinas Summa, Summa Theologiae, however much I love it, is not the catechism. It's not even, right, uh, it, it's not the official teaching of the Catholic Church. It's, it's the work of theology. Um, so I just say this, there are many small differences in theological tradition. None of them are substantive, including things like the filioque, but not, not substantive at all. Um, the whole question, the whole question is the nature of papal primacy in the constitution of the church. Everything else is quibbling, quibbling, not serious. Um, the question of papal primacy, even the question of papal primacy though, is not just a question of whether there should be or could be a first bishop, right? That's not, that's not the worry. The question is really about the privileges of the Bishop of Rome as that church. 
So one way to say it might be this. Um, how did the Bishop of Rome in the early church get those privileges? And the, the traditional Orthodox answer basically is by consent of the local churches somehow, right? So that the Bishop of Rome's position as, as first among bishops is a matter of like consent or convention. It's not a matter of God's will for the church. The traditional Catholic position is the Bishop of Rome has that position by divine right. God wanted Peter and his successors, this to be the, the, the bishop that is the first among bishops, right? And uh, so it's, but this question, it looks small, but it actually has a lot of implications for what it looks like to be one church. That's basically the question. That's why it's so critical we think about this a little bit more, because it's really a question of what is it to be one church? I don't think, so I should say, I think this is a serious reason that the Orthodox are in fact wrong, because I think they don't have an explanation for how it is that the bishops can act together officially. That's how I'd put it. So we might say the simple question is this, the bishops, uh, the Orthodox account of things is sort of along this lines, right? Only those decisions are binding on all Christians as representative of the official church, when they're, they're consented to by the bishops, by all of the bishops who constitute the Catholic Church. The problem is, for example, when heretics come along, heretics can be bishops, and the heretics never consent to being condemned, right? So if, if it was a condition that every bishop or every priest or every whatever had to consent to the decisions, that can't, the, the church then just can't teach. Right? The church would not be able to make binding teachings or decisions on ruling itself Right, if it was just a matter of consent. And the, the Orthodox, just like the Catholics, do think things like the ecumenical councils taught infallibly and are binding right, on us today. Um, there are different models of how that's supposed to work. The basic two models of the Orthodox account are the Moscow Patriarchate's model and the Greek model, which is more traditional. Uh, I could go into those if you'd like, um, but the problem is basically what I just said, which is how do you differentiate a legitimate council, a legitimate process of crafting canon law that really binds everybody? Because um, it looks like the local churches, the local dioceses, the local bishops could always claim we didn't agree to those rules, right? Ecumenical councils don't pass things unanimously most of the time. They have a vote to help figure out, right, how many people support something. But like you can find the tallies at Vatican II. People disagreed on every document that came out, right? There were some that didn't agree. So uh, we need some sort of rules for determining what it is for the church to act officially together. And that's important in lots of contexts. That's very helpful. Uh, yeah, I was having dinner with Swinburne once. And uh, we were talking about this sort of thing. He was kind of lamenting <laughs> that, um, you know, that they had a, a sort of, at least some in the church were attempting something kind of like an ecumenical council um, Crete. I, just just a, a few years ago, right? I mean, I think it was yeah, like the maybe Great six years. Council of Crete. Right. I think that's very good. I, I should say, I think this is a very good illustration of the problem for the Orthodox is everybody should agree, and, and the Orthodox do agree in theory, Schism is wrong. Breaking communion in the church is wrong, right? And um, when Moscow and Constantinople anathematize each other or break off communion, um, can you really think you'd go to hell for not being part of the Russian church, right? Or not being part of the Greek church, right? It looks like that's really not a big important thing, right? And so what happens on the Orthodox account, the consensus account, is the church gets being reduced to a local congregation, the one place where you belong, and schism becomes impossible to commit, right? <laughs> and uh, I think that that indicates the position in, in theology of what the church is, is totally confused. Right, yeah, so you had some people uh, representing the, the church that um, thought it was something much more authoritative <laughs> and bigger, right? And then you had other, uh, Orthodox thinking that, you know, this was just like a, a, mi a minor, more minor discussion and so forth. And, you, and 
no one even really had the same sort of view. At least this is what Swinburne was conveying to me. Yeah, uh, the Moscow Moscow said we didn't agree to Crete, right? Yeah. We we're not going. So the the decrees of Crete don't bind nobody. Yeah, they don't bind yeah. us. We didn't agree to them. So I mean, but that's that's to me an icon, right? <laughs> right of what what went wrong there. Uh, uh, okay, great. Yeah, no, that that's helpful. Um, I know you're in a, you're in a new book, right, on classical theism, um, edited with uh, Kuhn's and uh, Fuquay, um, and you have a chapter in there uh, on why classical theists should be uh, open or at least in, maybe even endorse, right, that there's a real distinction between God's essence and energies, or at least that's how I understand your paper. I haven't read it yet. Um, can you go ahead and just basically give a quick primer on energy essence distinction, especially so commonly understood in Eastern Christianity, and then uh, just tell us a little bit about your paper and why why you kind of make that claim or some claim not too far off from what I just stated. Right. So I should say why why should we care about this apart from our our obvious overwhelming love for true propositions? Um, the 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 problem. Uh, that I'm dealing with in this paper has to do with a famous Orthodox theologian by the name of uh, Gregory Palamas, who is, by the way, a saint on our Byzantine Catholic Church calendar. Thank you very much. And um, he, a monk in Constantinople, um, famously or infamously proposed a distinction between God's essence and God's energies in order to oppose what he saw as heretically exaggerated, and I think everybody should accept as heretically exaggerated, apophatic claims that we can't know God at all in this life. Uh, I was just listening. I'm, my Dominican brothers in the U.S. had some speaker who started off saying, we can't know anything about God. All of our language is metaphorical, right? And that's that's not what, what you know, right? Got, uh, Aquinas or the classical tradition would say, right? Because then you say things like, well, God kind of exists, right? God doesn't really exist. It's not true to say God exists. It's not true to say there's one God, right? And the classical tradition says, uh, mm, uh, mm, no, don't say that, right? There's, there's really just one God, God exists, things like that, right? Palamas tried to draw a distinction to help resolve this. He proposed, while we can't directly access God's essence, we have access in his particular context, we have access to God through God's energies. We have epistemic access to him, but we also have it through grace, right? Grace allows us to be in union with God through God's energies, even though we don't become God, right? We don't somehow unify with his essence. Um, and since God's energies are part of God, right? They're somehow the same God. To have access to God's energies is to have access to God. Now, the way I put it right there at the end by mentioning part, right? God has parts should, boom, red, red flags, klaxons should go off, right? Um, for anybody who, who, who knows the classical theist tradition. And that's the right answer. It's, the distinction is dangerous to many people. They think it's dangerous because it seems to introduce composition into God, making the essence and energies of God like parts. And so, for example, Tyler used this word real distinction. There's a real distinction between God's essence and God's energies. Now, actually, I don't say it's a real distinction. And I was surprised uh, after all this talk, Gregory Palamas doesn't say it's a real distinction either. Um, what he says is it's an uncreated distinction. It's an uncreated, there's, it's a, some sort of uncreated distinction. It's later people that read back into him the claim that it's a real distinction or give some other characterization. The problem with saying God has parts or would have a real distinction is it flies in the face of the affirmation uh, that is ecumenical and traditional, Orthodox and Catholic. Everybody accepts God can literally have no parts at all, <laughs> including being characterized by really distinct intrinsic properties. God can't, can't have that. Um, and really everyone agrees to it. And here's the reason I wrote my paper, including Palamas. Palamas defends that position in the context of his essence energy distinction. 
he says, well, God, clearly, right? There's no, there's not even properties in God, right? Those things don't, that would be crazy. That would be heretical. There's no distinctions in God. There's no parts. And so you have to wonder, right? Well, what is the distinction supposed to do then, right? If, if Palamas is a classical theist, right? What, what, what is the distinction doing? What is it supposed to mean when he says it's uncreated? So my paper, even though it starts with this fact about Palamas, um, my paper is not historical. I propose Palamas might accept the classical doctrine, but it doesn't really matter. I argue straightforwardly that there's this distinction between God's essence and energies, and it follows, it's entailed by a classical doctrine of divine simplicity, specifically the one that I'm, I'm interested in is Thomas Aquinas's, because I think he actually explicitly says he accepts the distinction. And the way to interpret that distinction is doesn't involve any composition in God. That's how I interpret it. So how do we get there? Well, here's a way to start. I do it with Buddhism because the Buddhists like to make arguments against the existence of God on bases like this. Consider the claim God both has the power to do all things. Uh, he could do many things he's not doing. And that he's actually doing only some of those things right now. This is like a, an argument made by a Buddhist uh, monk, Dharma Kirti. Now, right, if we thought those two things were absolutely identical, right, God's supposed to be identical with, with everything he is, no properties, no nothing, we get a weird claim that God necessarily or essentially must do what he does. God would be identical with his action, right, the little class of things he's actually doing, He's identical with that. And now it looks like it's essential that God does the things he does. He just has to act this way. He can't do other ones. Well, right, the, the classical tradition thinks this is nuts. They just deny this reading of the implications of, of divine simplicity. And what they say is they identify God with this action. God, God is what he does in some sense. But the identity doesn't entail this weird implication because the distinctions between God's actions and his essence are different modal contexts, just like the distinction between when we talk about God's essence and God being loving or God being powerful. When we say God's loving and God's powerful, we, we realize we're not saying what God is. We're saying true things about God, but the limits when we say loving and powerful are really in some way on our end, right? That's why we have to express the truths about God in this limited respect. And we'd be wrong, we'd be, we'd be missing something, right, if we didn't say other things, right? If I said God was loving and I didn't say anything else about him, I'd miss facts about God, right? That he's powerful, that he's good, right? That he's simple, right? All of those names of God, the reason you need many of them is because the human mind, as it were, is limited in how we express truths about God. To say then that God is identical with his love or God is identical with his power, doesn't entail by transitivity that God's love and God's power are the same thing in the sense that love and power are the same thing. What we mean is God's the same thing. And it's true to say he is his love and he is his power, but it doesn't, there's no transitivity because the, the breakup in the concepts of love and power, what we're expressing are on our side, right? They mean different things. They're different intentional contexts. Um, and so similarly, the claim entails that we could not describe God accurately in terms of what he is and what he does without using both of these ways of speaking that are characteristic of the essence of energy's distinction. So God really exists in both in these two different ways that we express truths about him. It's true, God is all powerful. God is his power. God's essence is such that he has all of this power, that he's loving, that he's all of these things, that he's identical. All of those things are identical in him. That's his essence. And, um, but it's also true that he's acting in particular ways, right? And uh, he's exercising that power, actually only in certain ways, creating the universe that he did rather than a different one. So in the same way, God is, we do this with properties too. God is goodness itself, like a universal, and he's a good, concrete, particular thing, right? Um, the fact we need to redouble our predications is because uh, it is what allows me to, to give a distinction between God's essence and God's energies. 
it's a fundamental distinction, right? What Palamas is pointing to is a fundamental distinction about how we, we, we think about God. And it's fundamental in the sense or uncreated that God really is both those ways. And they can't be reduced to something else. Like other properties of God can be reduced to other things. But this distinction between God's essence and God's energies is like basic or primitive or fundamental. And that's what I interpret him as saying by uncreated. And if that's what you think it is, it just follows from classical theism that this is true. Because it just turns out there are lots of truths about God. And we have to explain how they're all true, even though God is identical with all those things. So we got to make a move just like this. Um, and so that's that's how I think the Palamite tradition and the Thomas tradition have been unjustly treated as opposed, when I think they're actually really just saying the same thing, <laughs> right? And they just maybe got to the conclusion in slightly different ways. And so when you see the two different sets of arguments coming from different premises, you, you get confused, right? What what maybe the uh, the conclusion is, but I think actually they're they're really just the same conclusion. And I should also note historically, I think Palamas ends up saying things that confirm this. So I end the paper with I think some historical confirmation. Okay, thank you very much for that. I look forward to reading it um, whenever uh, the the volume <laughs> gets published. I think papers are due like now. So <laughs> hopefully we'll see that volume come out uh, sometime next year. Uh, yeah. Okay. So last 30 seconds or so, if you want to just tell us what you're working on, um, maybe you have, you're working on something interesting right now. You're researching some sort of area and you want to let us know. Yeah. So I always have tons of irons in the fire. I guess I just say um, two big projects. The one is a book that will hopefully be coming out this, this fall or winter through Bloomsbury Academic, uh, Material Objects in Confucian and Aristotelian Metaphysics. So this is all about hylomorphism, form and matter. I basically argue everybody who believes in material objects having parts, right, and they're not everything composes everything else, uh, you're committed to hylomorphism. Um, the second uh, so that's that's for the hardcore metaphysicians who love true propositions for their own sake. The other one is a book on freedom and the good, Beyond Classical Liberalism, an edited volume on political philosophy. And I have some projects there too uh, about political philosophy, trying to think about um, how we might move beyond some of these debates uh, about uh, liberalism. Uh, I think the solution to say we should just... Uh, blow up liberalism and make the Pope the King of America are not the way to go. Um, and that instead, uh, we need to think a little bit better about the natural law traditions way of thinking about public reasonability. So I have a paper, for example, on natural law as public reason. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father, for coming on. We appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, we hope to see you again in the in the future. And I hope to see you in the real life. <laughs> yeah, real life I mean, that'd I be nice. Back <laughs> to China. So thank you, Father. Thank you, Father Rooney. Okay. Most, most happy to be here. Thank you all for having me.